Hello and welcome to the Why We See Movies podcast. I'm your host, Ron Houghton. Joining me today, we've got Paul hey. and Dexter Brown. Hello, Governor. Our feature review today, for some reason, is the 1996 film The Arrival, starring Charlie Sheen and Lindsay Krauss. Oh, God, no. <laughs> I am, of course, joking. We will be reviewing Arrival, starring Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, and Forrest Whitaker. Uh, that Charlie Sheen movie's not really that bad. You no qualifier. No no yeah, I love seeing him with backward <laughs> legs hopping along at the end. <laughs> for him, it's not bad. Yeah. Later on, we'll do our rant and rave segment, but first, let's start with what's going on in the entertainment world with... You are the mark! <laughs> All right, well, the first batch of summer trailers are already arriving, and I thought we'd not only discuss these trailers, but maybe the movie as a whole. Uh, first and foremost, Marvel has released the first teaser trailer for Spider-Man Homecoming. What do we think? I'll start off. Uh, starts out like any other trailer. You got the, the music drawing you in, the pop song. Felt a little lame, and then it picked up pretty quick and really got me excited. I it, love that song. Uh, I thought it started off great immediately. To my ears, I've probably never heard it before. Yeah. Probably have, but don't know it, as you well know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, Birdman is Birdman. Who doesn't? I had, I didn't even know he was in it. And just to know he's the vulture now. <laughs> you think that's funny? It's fantastic. <laughs> From Birdman to the vulture. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, I'm really excited about it. I, I like that it's not an origin story. Christ's sake, we've seen enough Spider-Man origin <laughs> stories. Let's get, get, it. get into it. Everyone knows what happens. Uh, a lot of Tony Stark. It looks exciting. Paul? Yeah, I, I loved it. Spider-Man, uh, ever since I was a kid, has been my favorite Marvel superhero anyways. So it was a uh, nerdgasm to see him on the screen in Civil War. And just, I think they've got the right actor. And it certainly carries that tone through. Um, seeing, and, and they've even said that the, the tone that they're going for in the movie is like a John Hughes mm-hmm. style movie. And I think that comes through. And I think that's, I mean, it might not land with mm-hmm. the older audience, but I think it's very smart of Marvel to have a movie that's geared more towards a younger crowd that, I mean, we all for the most part, enjoy the Marvel movies. We're all going to go see it, and odds are we're going to enjoy it. And, yeah, I thought it was really good. I I'm, I was excited for it anyway, so I was just waiting to see the trailer. So Yeah, it looks like a nice, fresh take on this character. Yeah. And uh, I am not... I'm a big Spider-Man fan from the comics, but I have not been thrilled with any of the movies. I like the Sam Raimi movies. I don't watch them very often. This one with Andrew Garfield, I think we're pretty good. Maybe even a step up from Raimi's, the first one. The second one is deplorable. If, but, uh, if you can take Sam Raimi's part two, Andrew yeah, Garfield's part yeah. one, I think you have a great pair of Spider-Man movies right there. I agree. I'm not as big on Spider-Man 2 as a lot of people, like Ebert called it, the best superhero film of all time. Yeah, I'm, I'm with in that. close agreement to him on that. There's, I thought there's it was great been a lot that have come out since. better right. now. I, I haven't revisited that one in a while, mm-hmm. but I, I agree with Dexter that, mm-hmm. yeah, that of that trilogy, that is far and away the best. Mm-hmm. And they actually give you a sympathetic villain. Um, and, yeah, I really liked the take of Andrew Garfield. Um, maybe a little too cool for school, Peter Parker, uh, for the true, you know, spider fans out there, but I thought it was fun. It interjected the humor back into it, which I felt was kind of lacking. Maybe a true humor was lacking in the Raimi one. Like it just seemed really kind of goofy and weird on the last, on part three, but I really enjoyed the first one. The second one had moments that I liked, but the awful outweighed the good in that by far. The second one was when, ferocious. When you can make Paul Giamatti look like a right. child. Oh, within the first minute of that movie looked like made by committee just the yep. studio had their hands all over it yeah. of course later with the sony scandal we found out that was the case but uh but no but I, back to homecoming i just think yeah. this looks just so fresh i just mean i was kind of dubious about this and you know do we want another spider-man movie but after this trailer i am all on board for it i think it looks so much fun they seem like, to have nailed the character more, yeah and it's yeah. such confidence with this trailer alone, it's just it, these guys know what they're doing, and you can tell they're just they're ramping up this character to be such a big part of the MCU now. I don't know if you guys have heard, but just on the I don't know if it was the basis of the trailer alone, but Spider Man Two is already picking up the July slot for uh, 2019. Wow. wow, the missing one that I think in humans was going to uh, be taken care of. So uh, they're going full board with the sequel already. I think they 
they've got the perfect person to play the character, mm. somebody that's actually age appropriate, which is nice. Um, and yeah, you like you said, they've nailed the tone. Um, yeah, I, I think they're doing a lot of things right. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, I'm excited about Michael Keaton too. I think yes. he's going to knock it out. And why wouldn't they do more of them? It's Spider Man. I mean, there's few more marketable superheroes than than Mm spider-man and if they're doing it well let's have more my only worry was there was a lot of iron man in the trailer and i don't want it to be and i don't think it will be but my worry is that he will feature too heavily in it i don't mind him doing kind of in a pop in appearance and i think that'll probably be it yeah i've watched the trailer a few times i think i already kind of know how the story's gonna go i think it's probably gonna be begin with the Spider-Man returning right from the incidents of Civil War and Tony Stark kind of giving him a pat on the back and saying, you know, okay, you're on your own, kid, and, you know, behave. And we might not see him till later in the movie. You can also understand Marvel's point of view. Every movie since the Avengers that has had Tony Stark in it has made a billion dollars. Yes. Mm-hmm. So. Well, I mean, he, he was introduced as the mentor in Civil War, so it makes sense to carry that forward. I just don't want it to be a Spider-Man and Iron Man movie. I want it, I want it to be a true Spider-Man I don't Spider-Man think it's going to be that. Yeah, yeah, I don't either. But. They're using them to sell it, but... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, yep. high expectations for that. Guardians 2 look good, Yep. but I think this one looks even better. Yeah. Well, and we kind of already know what to expect from Guardians, whereas, like you had mentioned, you know, this is our next foray into Spider-Man, and we've been burnt by this before, so what What are we going to get? And there, I know there was a lot of speculation and nervousness online, kind of, why have we not seen anything yet as far as homecoming trailers you've seen a lot of kind of viral marketing set shots whatever but no official trailers so i think you know fanboys might their buttholes might have been puckered a little bit (laughs) so but it delivered absolutely hands down delivered yeah can't wait all right uh, another trailer that debuted i was war of the planet of the apes that'll be i think it's a trilogy so this should be the last one of these I know, Darren, you're a big fan of this franchise. Yeah, I absolutely love the Apes reboot movies. This trailer looks fantastic. Some great imagery in there, evocative of the original Charlton Heston film. And, yeah, I mean, just the way this trailer seems to be selling the story, I'd like to even see if if they're all as good as the first two. Yeah, make it four movies, make it five movies. Mm -hmm. I'll go see more if they're of consistent good quality. If this third one just wraps up the story so perfectly... Fine, we don't need more, but I'm probably more excited for this movie than anything else in 2017. Wow. Paul? I absolutely love the first two, like, Dex. And I was actually surprised at how much I really enjoyed the first one. I It was one of those kind of, all right, well, let's see. I don't, I don't think i even saw it in the in the theater i think i borrowed it from you ron and it it was it it had piqued my curiosity but yeah it slam dunk and then the sequel was fantastic i mean it sure it's cgi based but man it looks so Mm -hmm. good so good and it's intelligent storytelling and the imagery looked great the apes are so convincing it's some of the best special effects it looks like a very dark grim film yeah we're getting less and less human characters as we go you know obviously the rooting interest is going to be with the apes i i would assume i'm rooting for caesar in the second one that's for sure yeah Um, absolutely woody harrelson looks a little nutty in it yeah i was gonna say yeah interesting inclusion i had no idea he was even in it no and he seems to be about the only star in the trailer as far as i could tell yeah i haven't looked on imdb to see the Mm. cast list or anything but Mm. it looks that way but yeah it's it's high on my list for movies that i'm looking forward to next Mm -hmm. year as well it's such a kind of almost like a flying under the radar trilogy that it's so good and I think it'll do so well, but it's certainly not hyped up like like with Spider Man that we just talked about or Star Wars or something like that. Like it's not quite that level, but I think it's one of those solid movie franchises that I don't think a lot of people think of too much, but it's yeah, the first two installments have been really solid. Yeah, if they nail this third one, they really have something. I mean the original Planet of the Apes franchise has its big problems, you know. <laughs> yeah, you it's have, not a great franchise. You have a great opening a film and yeah. four pretty questionable sequels. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this one could really knock it out of the park. I'm excited. And who knows, right? If uh, if it's a huge success, you know, they're not going to stop. Yeah, I mean, it seems like to the end of this movie or some partway through this movie to actually arrive at a Planet of the Apes. Mm-hmm. 
Could that's, you see a possible that's the starting fourth point. film with no humans at all? I would watch it. Uh, Andy Serkis is as good as anything as uh, Caesar. Mm -hmm. And so... There's a few moments just from the trailer where I don't know how that acting is coming through, that CG, but it's... It's, it's riveting. Uh, They're yeah. fantastic. When he's got the gun to his head. And yeah. It's powerful. I, I don't know that they would ever go to... Uh, format like that where there's no humans i think they're the jungle book came pretty close what's that the jungle book came pretty yeah. close and i haven't seen that yet but i just know hollywood in the past is really they've been weary to have a movie where there's not a lot of human involvement like you look at a franchise not to go too far off but you get a movie thing like transformers where there should be minimal human involvement in a lot of it's it's called transformers it's supposed to be about the transformers not so much not shy of right exactly <laughs> like there's way too much in the way of humans there i just hollywood seems to be very weary of kind of going that way and maybe this is the franchise that does it i wouldn't want it though i wouldn't want a just an ape movie the whole originating idea in the apes franchise is to explore race relations and social ideas and you know socioeconomic caste like division right. between humanity with the apes as allegory and so you really lose some of that without right. the contrast of the apes versus the humans. Yeah, what I'm getting at is I think it's just harder. Anytime there's humans on the screen, they become the rooting interest usually, right? If it's but, humans against anything, I don't know if that's what this franchise, I've as, as a more archaic, right. a more archaic sensibility would be that way for sure. I mean, mm, that's your, you're, that you're in. You're yeah. often, uh, even in the original franchise, actually, there's a few of those mm. movies where you're cheering for the apes. A little off tangent here, but me and Kelly are watching Westworld lately, mm -hmm. and uh, she has so many problems with it because I'm rooting for the robots, right? And she's <laughs> rooting for the humans, so it's just like she's getting angry at certain scenes. I'm like, I'm all for it. So it's a little bit of that. Yeah, I mean, some people will always have that mentality. They mm -hmm. want to cheer for the humans over whoever it is. Look, how could you cheer for anyone over Caesar? Exactly. Agreed. All right. Uh, another trailer that debuted was the reboot for The Mummy with Tom Cruise. This, of course, is Universal Pictures' first film of their proposed shared universe, what they're going for. Are you guys aware of this? Yep. Uh, I knew they were rebooting Mummy. I don't they're know. They're trying to play catch up with Marvel, like every other studio they want. So are they using the, their universe, properties? Right. And yeah. Universal doesn't have a lot of Crossover franchises with that they Frankenstein own, right? and Dracula? That, so over the next few years, they're planning on doing all of these films that are going to be the Wolf tangentially. Man, the Invisible linked. Man. Yeah. Uh, next up is The Invisible Man with Johnny Depp. There's a Frankenstein project with uh, Javier Bardem, rumored. Mm -hmm. And uh, Russell Crowe, who's in The Mummy is scheduled to play Dr. Jekyll. So they got a good cast lining up for this. And I knew I knew Russell Crowe was involved in the universe, but I didn't expect to see him this soon. I, w I was actually surprised mm -hmm. to see him in the trailer. I think that's the whole point, is that they want to start introducing start this idea. Right, so, started early. So he yeah. is Dr. Jekyll in The Mummy. Right. All right. Well, I like the idea. It's mm -hmm. an interesting idea. The trailer looked like every Tom Cruise trailer from the last 10 or 12 years. Including does, the yeah. shot of him sitting alone, where he's sitting in, he's sitting in the plane... I'm like, this could yeah. be collateral damage. This could be Mission like Impossible. Mission Impossible. Yeah. Exactly. There's so many trailers. Jack Reacher. Just, it's it's yeah. all of them rolled up into one. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. he plays Ethan Hunt in every movie. Not that I don't like those films. Oh, for sure. So yeah. it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, it's just, it doesn't get me excited to watch them all. If it gets good reviews, right. sure, I'm on board. Absolutely. I'll watch it. I think it, that's but where I'm The trailer too. is just Ethan Hunt with Supernatural Mummies. Okay. They're going yeah. for a legitimately more of a scary movie, I've heard. Yeah. Like there's supposed to be some genuine and horrific elements more than an action spectacle. Well, and it's we'll interesting that it's, it's, it's a the trailer horror, doesn't it's, show that. They're no, it looks like, like an action film. We'll see. Well, and I, I, I think it's interesting that they're deciding to make it modern day because that's one of the charms that I felt about the Brennan Fraser mm -hmm. trilogy, and I actually never saw the last one, but the first two, I actually really liked the first one, the second one, whatever, it had its issues. But part of that charm was seeing them in that time period, and yeah. it'll be interesting to see how that works modern day. Right. So, which yeah, I guess... Yeah, take. Yeah. You know, I think they, you know, they just redid Wolfman. They... Read Dracula. Dracula. To not great success, right? So maybe they're thinking, let's change the period and see what happens. No, they got nothing to lose. Yeah. All right. Besides trailers, um, just one bit of news has dropped in the last few days. Rogue One first reactions have come out. They are stellar. Uh, through the roof. I'm only getting more excited for this movie. I don't really have any news. I just wanted <laughs> to say that. Yeah, uh, yeah just, I've I'm heard the same thing. 
Yeah. And it's this I'm still is a on movie. a trailer commercial embargo on it. I'm turning off yeah, anything that immediately. Yeah. The minute but. it comes on on the TV like when I'm watching football, it's immediate mute or la 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 over top of it. I just I already know more than I probably want to know. I don't I, I, there's so little that we know going into this. Like I was talking with a buddy about this yesterday. We were talking about the excitement gearing up for this. Like even though we didn't know a lot going into Force Awakens, you knew the old characters were going to be included. So you had that element of familiarity. Whereas going into going into this, you don't really know a lot. Mm-hmm. Like you know, there's Death Star plans involved, and they're trying to steal them. And other than that, there's not a lot you know. There's no Luke, Han, or Leia. So, right. yeah. I mean, and because of that, too, I'm also far less excited. And it seems like... Far I mean, or less excited? Far less, compared to The Force Awakens. Really? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Oh, The Force Awakens. I couldn't barely sleep the night before I had my tickets. And yet some of the early reviews are saying that this feels like more of a Star Wars film than even Force Awakens did. That's mm. good. But, uh, yeah, I, I still have a more of a wait-and-see kind of mentality mm. for it. But you've got your tickets. I've got my tickets. Well, we're going to do a podcast, and we, we better all go see it. <laughs> but, uh, um, no, I was going to say, uh, in Amazing Spider-Man 2, you talked about how committee-directed it was. Mm-hmm. And that's just how this movie is so consistently felt to me. Like, Really? It's, it seems yeah, like it's that. a result of marketing and committee planning cool. and focus groups and so on that I was just thinking, well... Are we going to have any actual vision from the director here? What are we going to see? And so, yeah, these early reviews have really allayed those fears, and I am excited. I think from the first trailer for that movie, I was I had chills. Like, you mm-hmm. see, for me, and this speaks to how much of a Star Wars nerd I am, I suppose, my favorite land vehicle is the AT-AT. And seeing that walking on a beach, I was like, oh, God, that's amazing. And just little geek moments where you see the dish sliding into place on the mm-hmm. Death Star and just those little things that I, Yeah, great I, I agree. I, great imagery, but I never fully trusted it. Yeah. And, and now and that the reviews enough. are coming out on You're Lord, a skeptical man. Lord, trust, well, I am a skeptical man. Lord knows we've been <laughs> bitten by a lot of trailers this year, so Suicide Squad. Um, <laughs> it's true, but yeah. I, I, have, guess I have high Star hopes Wars. for this and I think it's gonna be yeah. paying it off in spades. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I so. Right. I hope it's it's a sign of things to come with these standalone star wars movies and mm-hmm. i think i've kinda, yeah exactly it's uh if this is it's got to set the bar for the rest of them right and i think i've been well not only burned by movies this year but even like phantom menace you can argue the merits of that movie forever but just the hype around it that kind of was the straw that broke the camel's back for me where i've always for now and evermore will have a tempered enthusiasm i i love star wars and i will always be hopeful that it's good but i guess i i there's that nagging little doubt that you just never know i guess are we? You guys are all seeing it opening weekend. I'm seeing it Friday at seven thirty. Friday at seven thirty. Really? Sunridge yep. AVX. I'll Excellent. see you there, Paul. All right. <laughs> That's cool. Um, in other Star Wars news, Lucasfilm has you know every time that a new movie comes out. Speaking of Episode Eight, every studio has to register you know these titles and get their you know property Names exactly uh-huh. planted. So it looks like uh, in the last few days they've uh, filed two hundred different domain names for uh for this title so it's probably looking at episode eight will be entitled the forces of destiny crickets Hmm. Uh, it's not a good great title no uh has any star wars title ever been met with fanfare i think every star wars title is really and then the movie's great and you're like okay that's the title yeah yeah fair enough it just to me, sounds like a video game title. Like it doesn't sound like a like a title. It, it doesn't sound like a Star Wars <laughs> title. Yeah, fair enough. It doesn't. No, I don't think so. Forces no. of Destiny. Eh, you it know, almost, it sounds like it doesn't have that feel to it. Like, well, and it almost sounds like a peripheral media title, like a comic or a video game, or or just mm-hmm. something that's based around a Star Wars property. It's this isn't for sure yet. Yeah. This is just speculation that's been going on. But if if the like you say, if the movie is fantastic, then it's not going to affect anyone's what's opinion in the name? of whether the movie's good or not. No, yeah. no. Nope. Yeah. John Williams is recording the score over the next few months, so that shows how close they are to a finished product. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be the usual pickups over the summer and mm-hmm. some re-editing in the fall, as happens with every movie. But yeah, there. Yeah, who knows? Coming close. First look at it. There better be a trailer in a week from now. <laughs> Come Friday. Honestly, I think they'll. They'll wait. I think they'll let... Uh, they don't want to they, interfere with Rogue One. Yeah, yeah that's a exactly. good point. Especially considering it is kind of an unknown commodity. Sure, it's Star Wars, but yeah, I don't think they want to take away from any of the momentum. Yeah, that's a good good point. When yeah. did we get the Force Awakens trailer? Or the title? Was that a good year before the movie? 
I don't even feels recall. more. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember. Me neither. See, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Should we move on to our feature review? Let's do it. Let's do it. This is the day they arrived. The object touched down 40 minutes ago. Mama, it's going to happen. I don't know. Dr. Banks, you're at the top of everyone's list when it comes to translations. You hear any words? Is that? Yes. Am I the only one having trouble saying aliens? So what do they look like? You'll see soon enough. They need to see me. Dr. Banks? Now that's a proper introduction. More objects have landed around the world. It's their language. We got 21 hours before they start global war. They're not our enemy. We need to talk to them. It's more complicated than that. How is it more complicated? Are you dreaming in their language? What does it say? Weapon. So how do we clarify their intentions? I go back in. What is she doing? You are committing an act of treason. Do you trust me? Okay. Uh, The IMDb summary, a linguist is recruited by the military to assist in translating alien communications. Uh, It's directed by uh, Denise Villeneuve, uh, written by Eric Hessier from a story by Ted Chiang. Okay, first impressions for Arrival. I keep wanting to say The Arrival. I've been able to quell that need to say the a a month or two ago, but yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's um, one of the best movies of the year. Uh, Fantastic. Great storytelling. I've not seen a bad movie from, is it Denise? I always want to say Denis. 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 French Canadian, so I don't totally know. Right. Phil Neuve. Fantastic director. He's got a great vision. Uh, This movie delivers. Some of his previous films being Prisoners, Sicario. uh, Incendies. Uh, enemy with Jake Gyllenhaal. An enemy, right? I think okay. those are all his previous yeah. films. All right. Yeah, I like them all. This is maybe the best of them. Mm. I really like Incendies, uh, his debut. But anyways, uh, yeah, going into this, I'm sure many people thought, okay, we've seen the Alien Arrival movie before. We've seen the First Contact type movie before. I kind of trust him to do something different. So what's it going to be? And it was. It, even early on, I thought it was going to go down. It felt like it was going down similar territory that we've seen before. You guys might know what I'm talking about. I won't specify quite yet. Yeah, we'll get into spoilers. In but a bit. Uh, it no, and then he takes it in his own way, develops an original story. Uh, Amy Adams. Well, I mean, I won't. She's great. I won't ramble on too much. She's a great actress. Let's hear Paul. What your first impressions are? I. I loved it. I purposefully, as we were talking before we started recording, I purposefully went into this knowing as little as possible. I saw, I think it was the 30-second teaser, and I just knew immediately this was a movie that I was likely to enjoy, and I was not wanting to know too much going into it, and I'm really glad I did. Absolutely one of the best movies of the year, if not my favorite movie of the year. Fantastic. Like, just intelligent storytelling doesn't really hold your hand through the process of storytelling kind of makes you figure it out as as it goes um tour de force performances and just had me from the opening scene i was invested and i think it did a very good job of kind of grabbing your attention right away like a a bit of a slow burn but definitely worth it i I don't mind a slow movie at all yeah and and it didn't feel long yeah Yeah. like as long as the story's progressing Mm -hmm. as the rate it should then fantastic i I right and there's a there's a difference between slow and boring yes oh yeah absolutely like i think everything that was in there needed to be in there and definitely painted the canvas perfectly it was just fantastic and made me want to check out more by the director i i didn't realize he did sicario which i saw on a plane coming back from europe this summer and enjoyed what i saw but i mean it's watching it on a plane so how much do you really absorb but no it was fantastic loved everything about it excellent i loved it as well this is my favorite kind of science fiction film for sure i love smart films like this it reminds me of films like contact and close encounters and 2001 solaris and ai these movies you know it's right up there top shelf it reminded me a lot of contact just in feeling not story Mm -hmm. necessarily Mm -hmm. but definitely and even more serious than that film yep in some ways um Mm -hmm. Zemeckis can't help but go for spectacle, right? I was uh, amazed at this movie's restraint. It, yeah. uh, it never goes off the rails and into big budget blockbuster territory. It always stays smart. Yeah, I love that Amy Adams is fantastic in it. 
Yeah, there was arguably some, you can't quite call it action, but uh, mm. some... Ex- there were some tense some moments. Moments of right. in high intensity and excitement that maintained that without the need for right. delving the, into big budgets and big special The scenes of her effects. deciphering the alien language are as thrilling to me as any yeah. car chase. Oh, I agree. And the just humor in it, too, where she'll she'll say a line and you're thinking, really? And then she totally undercuts that with like, nah, nah, I was just making that up or whatever. You guys, you guys will know what I'm talking about, but I don't want to say anything because it's spoiled. Wise, but perfectly played. I, yeah. Mm-hmm. And Jeremy Renner is the typical Jeremy Jeremy Renner performance again. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> I read a few reviews the next morning after I saw it. I can't remember who said this now, but someone wrote uh, Jeremy Renner looking like he's very happy not to be holding a bow and arrow in this movie. <laughs> 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 it's, it's nice that the lady is the lead, though, and not. I mean, mm. this movie was made hell even five or seven years ago. It would have been totally reversed. And I guess depending on who the filmmaker is as jody foster was allowed to carry contact right. but uh it's it's refresh it's sad that we have to say it's refreshing to see a female lead but uh, it's refreshing to see nonetheless and well, well and it is it is sad like you say that that is still an issue because you get something just to go back to rogue one where the initial pushback against that was oh god what is this star wars meets hunger games why because you've got a female protagonist mm-hmm. it's ridiculous and i agree with you like uh, they're only like fifty-four so... percent of the planet. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, it's so and you've got somebody with such cachy and star power. Let her run with it. Let mm-hmm. her let her do what she does. And she's Amy Adams is kind of a personal favorite of mine. I she's great. I would she's... put her in any. She's one of my favorite. I, it's actresses. only been recently that I've seen a lot of movies with her in it. And yeah, she is fantastic in everything. Those opening scenes where she's just oblivious to what's happening is yeah. fantastic to watch. Yeah. Great, great start to the film. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. really sets up that character yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah there's uh the plot of this is so spoiler driven i don't know if we want to head into spoiler think, territory yet. yeah i don't so think we can actually can talk really about this film discuss it too much especially in text with her you know talking about her character and what she's going through yeah For okay sure. so this is spoiler territory spoiler alert. Spoilers. spoilers okay clear <laughs> um of course uh her character's backstory with her and her daughter are the central piece of this movie. And uh, I wasn't exactly sure. I knew it was going somewhere and it was going to tie in thematically to the rest of the story somehow. I'm not sure if I yeah. quite understood it, but boy, did it really pay off. It's what initially had me worried about, oh, well, we saw contact already, but mm-hmm. come on, Villeneuve, I think you're going to give us something different. And yeah, he totally did. It was not at all the Jodie Foster father love story, not love story, a tragic loss story. Mm-hmm. Uh, it shone through with a great new original take and did you ever see where i as can't you remember saw more flashbacks did you ever kind of no i can't remember what, what points I, flash I realized instead? yeah right. i can't remember when i realized i think for me the point i realized was when they flashed to that picture that the daughter drew on the fridge and it had yeah the father and, and the canary the canary. And the canary and it was yeah. the canary that that, that, like, that must have been it well that's, that's when and that's probably the big moment anyone who says they knew it before then is a fucking liar anyway yeah. so <laughs> yeah yeah a great great twist on i mean so perfect in developing the aliens in that way i don't know if that originated with the short story or the novel or screenplay but yeah the, these aliens exist both in the past and the present and they they're writing their linguistics is mm-hmm. similarly without a beginning and end it's just mm-hmm. a great idea who right the whole idea whoever thought just, of that right want to see everything think of that, the, yeah their language is is a circle there there is no beginning i didn't even much think like Holy much like the daughter's yeah. name of course hannah which is yeah you know, the palindrome yeah. and why should they even think the same way that we do about yeah. anything? Yeah. Why is yeah. our perceptions about how we see things the way things really are? You know, it's that kind of human arrogance that we've got it all figured out if we could only explain things to them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, and I love the fact that, much like I alluded to in my initial take on the movie, is that it, it really doesn't hold your hand through it and explain everything that's going on. Like, it makes you figure things out as it goes. And... And yeah, that's something I want to talk to you guys about because there's something I'm not even sure about. Yeah, that I want to see your opinions on it. But sorry, Paul, oh, go ahead. That's all good. But yeah, I just it, it just the fact that it's making you figure it out as the characters figuring it out, and you're very much along for the ride. And yeah, I was blown away with the storytelling and just the reveals were perfectly timed. And it it was kind of one of those things, almost like a usual suspect moment where you figured out that Kevin Spacey was Kaiser Sose. Where you're, I got it, I got it, I got it. And that reveal, I was so... Uh, it, it was the kind of movie that the minute it finished, 
Mm-hmm. I was so excited. It was too bad my wife was so tired and had fallen asleep <laughs> for the last 20 minutes of the morning. Oh, no. that's too bad. Because <laughs> I desperately wanted to talk for about it, sure. but I had nobody to talk about <laughs> it with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that big reveal to me had allusions to Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I don't know if you guys felt that way. It's been too long since I've seen that. I'm too far removed from it. The whole idea that a character, they know Mm -hmm. the consequences of the future beforehand, and they they press ahead with it anyways, despite that. Mm -hmm. I I love that concept, and it works so well in both films. The funny thing is, and I don't know if either of you two had the feeling, but just the way the, the movie opens, and you can see the emotion on... Amy Adams' face as she's holding her baby. I don't even know why I was thinking it, but I was thinking, is her child dead? Like, was she, was, did she lose this child early on? Because she had, you know, there was something. Like a stillbirth or something. Yeah, yeah, now that you bring that up again, I did kind of, for a split second, think that myself Mm -hmm. too. And then, oh no, you can see the baby moving. Okay, but yeah, yeah, I'd say that now that I hadn't thought of it. hindsight. That's obviously very intentional now that you mention it. Yeah. What she's thinking about. Because I was thinking like. This movie's going to get so much better on a second viewing. Yeah. Oh man. Absolutely. Because like I said, I was like, oh God, like how devastating would that be? And then, like you said. Okay, the the baby's moving. We're okay. We're okay. And then, yeah, to bring it first full circle where you don't know at that moment the journey you're about to embark on. And such a, I mean, to me, it was such a movie about choices in that mm-hmm. way, and just not just in the conventional sense, which it is, but in a very unconventional sense too. Like, why do you even need to make a choice? You know, we think of things in such black and white terms, uh, good and bad. Or is it going to be war or not war or peace with the aliens? But you don't even really need to break it down that way. You can, but at the same time, why even make a choice? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, there are choices to be made, but at the same time, you can just avoid the choices altogether, as Amy Adams seems to evolve to do over the course of the movie and is the better person for it. I love the conflict that's presented, too, which is not really us at war with the aliens as much as us at war with ourselves. Yeah. You know, we oh, have yeah. to figure out our own shit first. And what an allegory to just not only modern politics, but the 20th century of world powers working together in such right. magnificent ways. Yeah, it seemed like maybe that whole notion of, you know, with the aliens, the lesson they were forcing us was maybe about the only predictable thing in the movie for me. But yeah, it's a lesson that we still haven't learned as human beings. No, yeah, so exactly. maybe we have to keep being told this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One plus one does equal two, kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I... I agree, and that is that is one of the things that I absolutely loved about the storytelling is that, yeah, it was very much the aliens sitting back and, okay, you guys you guys figure it out, and once you guys figure it out, you can come to us and we'll work with you. But A nice you know. homage to uh, the tripods of mm-hmm. War of the Worlds. Oh, yeah. right. Well, we'll have to pause. We'll just give them a few more. Yeah, that's, yeah, I like that idea. I, I like the design of the aliens. We've seen so many movie aliens that there's always a bit of a disappointment here uh, when you see a new alien. And so, it, I don't know, it keeps them in the fog mm-hmm. much of the time, a little, a little misty even. It's a little bit less you see. The yeah, it, see, right? it's less nice that way. It kind of, it helped them out, I think. it's They were a cool design. And we don't really know. We never get an idea of what the atmosphere is behind that glass either. Are no. they floating in something? Or yeah, exactly. Kind of, even when she's know. in there, it's almost, you see that they're much bigger than you thought. Mm-hmm. And then Which, at the same time, what exactly are they still? It's hard to it's hard to say. And, and I like the reveal that you were only seeing a part of the picture. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of a, a theme of the movie where, yeah, oh, yeah. You're, you're only seeing a little bit, almost like what you want. And there's a bigger picture out mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. What do we think of how they communicated that design with the ink blot and Oh, very great. I thought it was wonderful. Yeah, Original, just unlike anything I've seen in a movie yeah, before. Yeah. Very cool. I was I was worried that they were going to go with kind of go down the road of things that we've seen before where at first where you heard them. I was thinking, oh, God, are we doing the whale songs thing again? Let's not do that, <laughs> right? Like, we, we've done that. Let's move on. I find it funny that they came up with a program for their tablet pretty quick so that they were able to. <laughs> <laughs> they knew it eats luch and splatch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, <Bet>. they, <laughs> Maybe they plugged it into Rosetta Stone. And it was one of the conveniences it's, of the plot. It, but right. It's, they still. always have to mess around and cheat a little bit with that kind of thing. But yeah, it was but a I nice... Think it worked. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. And when they... Mm. You mentioned when they rule out, oh, the sounds have nothing to do with the language. That was a cool moment. So, okay, now mm-hmm. it's entirely pictograph. It's entirely visual. Well, okay, let's get down to it and start interpreting this. It was very neat that it wasn't going to be just, like you said, the whale sounds or some bleeps and bloops or... Mm-hmm. I also loved how Amy Adams 
had to explain how exactly what she's doing, right? How she's breaking down communication, how communication really works, mm-hmm. how a question can – the whole kangaroo thing and, yes. you know, how mm-hmm. questions can be so misinterpreted. Mm-hmm. You say the wrong word and, you know, the word weapon and tool can be yeah. misapplied. And, and I loved – I sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. Uh, that One thing I loved is the accountability too where you saw – you appreciate and obviously you're invested in her character and you're along that ride. You're, you know, trying to figure it out. But I love that there was the accountability – for the from the army too like forrest whitaker's character where okay i get that but you have to give me something that i can tell mm-hmm. to my superiors right that is gonna sell this so mm-hmm. that we can continue doing this yeah he comes across as more three-dimensional than you would think yeah you think that he'd be the army baddie right mm-hmm. michael stilberg plays that role yeah, in the cia stilberg and is, he plays man, it really such well a good character actually. yeah for sure a few other things that i liked um Directing wise, were you guys impressed with that opening tracking shot when the helicopter is first, when they're first seeing the shell and they're being brought down? I don't know about you guys, but I had kind of a weird feeling seeing it on the screen. It was almost, uh, I don't know what it was. It reminded me of the Shining tracking shot at the beginning. Yeah, it's it was good. Um, good comparison. Yeah, that kind of 360 around the ship before they landed. I just thought, I'd never, never seen a tracking shot was, really uh, like that. It was uh, kind of uh, weirdly gets in your unsettled. in your gut. Yeah, kind of unsettling. Yeah, and that's. Part of how it built its suspense, too, mm-hmm. in that slow, deliberate way. What are we even looking at here, and what is it? And here's and, a glimpse of it, and sure. then, oh, no, back to the Army base. So. And another element that I really thought worked was uh, the score. Yeah. How it was sort of organic. With Yeah, it felt it, almost It was like, almost like uh, the aliens brought their own score. Yeah, I was going to say, like a, a symphony that could have been written by one of the heptapods or right. something. Yeah. Like it's... And I could have listened to that for a lot longer. Like, even the cre- end credit scene came up, and I was... I didn't want to leave the theater. But yeah, it's just it might be that, the most effective use of score I've seen in a film all year, mm. in my opinion. It really worked. Just to go back to your unsettling feeling, I felt like even the pod design was maybe a little bit geared towards that because that's one thing I noticed is it wasn't symmetrical. It was you looked at it and it was very mm-hmm. uneven and and that's not something you typically see. Usually it's you know the the picture of idealism it's perfectly Mm -hmm. symmetrical it's perfectly you know egg-shaped or something but yeah it was very much i read someone one of the reviews called it a a giant contact lens which is kind of a good way of putting it but then seeing how it all related to the other ones around the world it it made sense yeah for sure do we have any problems with this movie i would say if i had any problem and it's a minor one but the moment with general shang i thought Mm. and this is kind of what i want to mention to you guys too and i don't know maybe it's deliberate part of it's unclear to me so i talked about it with megan and i said like i didn't even really kind of think about it in this term until the next day are we to assume that when they had their meeting that uh, was the first time she got his number yes that but also these confrontations were happening with heptapods and it was all coming down to the wire had general shang's wife died yet Oh, or was she still alive? Megan said, "No, no, she had already died. It was it was the transference of the last words that really meant something." I would say she would have had to have died for those words to but have not a resonance necessarily. with him. If it occurred to Shang at that moment, the same way that was Amy Adams' character's name Louise, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. So at the same time that when Lu- and if it if it happened to him the same way it, it happened to her, and you, it was all of a sudden just a moment of such. Why would you assume the same things happening to him though? Because look at how he changed his behavior. He changes on a dime, all right. Yeah, that's and why. I, that, that's that, why I think. And it would it would have to be to me his way, my way of thinking, my interpretation. Unless there's something in the movie that negates this that I don't remember, plot wise. But yeah, my interpretation is now I came up with this the day after is that his wife wasn't dead yet at that moment, and he was able to see. Oh my God, this is what's going to happen, and these are her last words, which she hasn't even spoken yet. I, I can't answer that one. I'd I, have to see I, it a second time. I can't answer it, but yeah, you're right. And and I hadn't even considered that. But so anyways, yeah. long story but that's short. Not, but that's not a problem. Long story short, really. that's my problem is that maybe if that's what he wants us to feel, it's not as clear as it could be. Maybe he wants us. Maybe he wants us to think that, but wants it to be ambiguous in that way. I don't know. Like I said, it's a minor problem, if anything. But it's just it's a little unclear, and it's not. It wasn't an immediate moment of realization watching the movie. It was it took some time for me to arrive at that. And then I thought, well, maybe there was even something spoken in the movie that negates my theory. I don't know. I'd have to go back and rewatch it. But anyways, yeah, so that's one of my major 
The only thing I've heard of. And, and still, it's, yeah. and for major, it's pretty minor, right? Yeah, when I say it's, major, major, right. not in terms of the problem, but major in terms of my major interpretation of the film. Right, as to what it's tr- the point and, it's and, trying and to get across. And it includes a minor quibble, mm-hmm. depending on what Villeneuve wanted us Right. One of the do you, th- do you think that, sorry to get back, but do you think that whole, the whole way that everything wraps up? A little you know, do, do you think it is a little too wrapped up neatly and contrived? And does it's it? I, I don't know what movie it reminds me of, it but it's almost like Bill you know, Ted's like, a little. You, let's go. Let's <laughs> remind each other to put this behind the desk tomorrow or whatever or yesterday. Everything seemed wrapped up really quick, and all of a sudden, all the nations of the world have decided, no, nope, we're all going to work together, and everything's going to be okay. Well, that's once again part of my interpretation, uh, and I don't know. Shang and Louise are the microcosm of the whole world in that movie and all the 12 nations where the the pods have landed but then do we extrapolate further and say like the revelation came to all of them and or we're never it, told like, that yeah there were so many countries that were following chang like once he was amping up armaments to attack the aliens you had the people that were following him he obviously had some cachet and power that once the realization hit him maybe he's for sure. Was, to... was it his political influence mm-hmm. or, yeah, the realization yeah. that they had? But I was, I was getting the feeling that Luis was making a breakthrough with these aliens that nobody else was. Right? Yeah, yeah. That she was making real communication and maybe having a link with these aliens that nobody else did. I don't know if it's – they don't really ever get into that. We, maybe just, on a second viewing. Yeah, yeah definitely. They definitely beg a second viewing. Yeah, nobody trusts anybody. And the minute anybody has a significant breakthrough, they're kind of cutting off communication. Like yeah. trying to get what they can from everybody else. And then once Not they, share anything they have. Yeah. Exactly, which yeah, human nature, I guess. If you're trying to be the one to make the breakthrough, you're gonna be a little mm-hmm. cutthroat. What do we think about the idea that uh, the aliens, even though they're coming here to, you know, establish this link and everything, uh, we later find out that uh, in three thousand years from now, right, we're actually going to be he- helping the aliens, much like the Ewoks helped <laughs> Ron <Right>. and Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, great. I, think. I thought that was a, that was a neat idea. It's, it's yeah. something that's going to bug some. And of course, some people audiences. will say, "Well, if you know, if they're so advanced from us, why? Didn't, how can they possibly need our help?" Yeah, and people want to know. They, well, how do we help them? What or do we if do? they know what us happens? in the future, why don't they already know our language? Which, of course, three thousand years from now, even if English is the primary language, it's not going to be spoken the way that we still speak it today, right? It's going to have some major changes. Yeah, and it's fun to debate that too. Mm-hmm. Like, why? Why? Like, why would they need us? But I think it's also partly because like any problem solving technique you you can't like if you go to one of these locked rooms where you're problem solving your way out you can never have a room full of people that all think the same way you need people that think a different way that problem solve differently so they obviously must need us for the way our brain works as opposed to theirs it's true it's a good way of putting it we see in a linear way in the way that they don't maybe that's what they needed to save them it doesn't matter when it comes down to it it's a plot device for the movie but Mm -hmm. some people will be bothered that they don't know but yeah does it matter no it's it's just no it doesn't detract from the film at all in fact it just makes you want to see it again so really um yeah it's too bad that we only get one of these movies uh, every really four or five years it's very infrequent for a very smart sci-fi movie like this to come out and it's doing very well, so I hope that's a sign that, you know. Yeah, I mean, I saw it a month into its run. and Yeah, I was on a, surprised on a weekday at how many night, people were in the theater. The theater was still a good third yeah. full. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, it's good. It's, I'm glad it's attracting good audiences. Yep. Yeah. One of the most quiet audiences I've been in a while, too. Nice and yeah. well-reserved. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It was a refreshing change. <laughs> yeah, people paying attention to what's going on. <laughs> Wait, I have to concentrate on the story? Excellent. It wasn't so a Fast have, and Furious uh, movie, though. So, yeah. <laughs> so do we have uh, final thoughts on this? I, I loved it, and as we've said a couple times, I can't wait to revisit it. And I think it'll be just as fun watching it through a second time and seeing how well it does achieve the whole uh, circuit of narration go- starting at one point and kind of almost ending mm-hmm. up back right. in the same place. Very nuanced film like this. I'm really looking forward to seeing it the second time and... And like you said, oh, the fun is seeing where it's going. But now watching it the second time, yeah, the fun is going to be knowing how it unfolds, just watching that process and picking up on those different things. And yeah. Yeah. I actually think it's going to be a dramatically richer film on a second watch. Well, and the fact that it'll be a different experience the second time around, too. For sure. Like 2001, it'll be more enriched the second time you watch it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, every flashback is going to have a little more poignancy now. Right? Oh, yeah. A little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, I love this movie. Like I said, it's going on my top shelf, my favorite science fiction films of all time. Yeah. So I cannot wait to see what this guy is going to do with Blade Runner 2 next year. Yes, agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After this one, he is a perfect choice for this. I cannot think of anyone else I want. If they're going to tackle this movie at all, you know, I'm glad that it's in hands like his. Have a little more faith in the project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you guys excited about this sequel? Are you guys like fans of I'm the not original a Blade, Blade Runner? Fan, but I'm a Villeneuve fan, so yeah, I'm really excited to see what he does with this. Me, I I like Blade Runner. I, I think I need to... I, I think I've seen it two or three times and seen two or three different edits of the movie. So maybe need to revisit it. I, I do enjoy it, and there's some great performances in there. But it's certainly not one of my favorite movies. And maybe on a revisit that'll change. Mm-hmm. But uh, I love it. It's it is one of my favorite movies. I've seen it. Yeah, I'm borrowing many this. many times. I'm going to borrow this from Chris. He said about Blade Runner when he was watching it. It felt like to him he should be enjoying it more than he was. And I said that's kind of yeah, that's yeah. a good good. And way I kind to put of, it. yeah, for sure. It's it's not a film. You know, it's going to warm up to you, really. You got to, you know, <laughs> no, you I've seen do it two or three work. times, and I'm just very middle of the road on it still. It just doesn't speak to me. Other than Sicario and, and Arrival, I haven't seen anything else of his. So I definitely want to check out more. And if it's a property that I'm already somewhat familiar with, that piques my interest. His, his attachment to the project probably piques my interest more than the subject matter. And I know some yeah, of my me. sci fi friends would probably just want to bitch slap me right now, but because they're huge fans. Good for that. them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I can't wait for it. I think it's got a Christmas release, so it's about a year away. Well, fantastic. But the big question is are you a replicant or a replicant? replicant. <laughs> <laughs> are you Antonio Banderas? <laughs> okay, so that's our uh, thoughts on Arrival. We'll do the Charlie Sheen move another time. Let's do the rant and rave segment. Okay, Dexter, why don't you begin? All right, I'll go. I got two things, so I'll start with one, and then I'll let you two have your turns. And then I'll go to my second thing. How does that sound? <laughs> Fantastic. I'm building some suspense here because I think my second thing is the more interesting of the two. My first, I'll, I won't be too long with this because the, audience, the audience is limited. But uh, uh, Quartet Records, which is a soundtrack specialty label based in Spain, and they, they get a fair number of American releases and so on that they do. But being Spanish-based... That is their main focus, and they've recently released this five-disc box set of uh, the film music of Alberto Iglesias, no relation to (laughs) Julio or Enrique. Answer that question. He scores all of Pedro Almodovar's films, as well as a number of other Spanish directors. So things like Volver and Talk to Her. What was this one called again? Uh, The Skin I Live In. The Skin I Live In, exactly. It's it's just a picture, but... uh, um, and some of his films that North American or English-speaking audiences might be more familiar with, The Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy, The Kite Runner, The Constant Gardener, Exodus, Gods and Kings, the recent Ridley Scott film. That's the only score of his I'd ever owned. Right. And all those movies have a bit of a foreign flair to it, too. Yeah, exactly. They're not too American right. by a long shot. Uh, he's a composer I've always really enjoyed. Uh, anytime I watch an Almodovar film, especially Talk to Her, that score I really enjoyed. Uh, I've always enjoyed his music, but I've just never really purchased anything and you know known a whole lot about him so when this got released like a five cd retrospective i think it was 30 euro thereabouts so uh, that's a good way to cover this composer's career autographed copy and was one of the first 50 to buy one nice Ooh. and uh yeah it's uh if you want to listen to film music that is not the conventional hollywood type it's a very good listen and perhaps one day we will intro or outro our show with some of his music excellent yeah. oh, so that is my first Show and tell, rant and rave segment. I pass the baton to Paul. Dexter's going to educate us on his film score ways. <laughs> <clears throat> Something to look forward to. Seriously. Uh, I've got a couple things. Uh, I'll start just with something that I mentioned a couple podcasts ago. For those that are loyal listeners and for those that aren't, well, guess what? This is new. And we know you all are. Yeah. <laughs> all two God of you. Damn it. Loyal or unloyal or something. Uh, so the first thing I have is uh, I finally made my way through the original Star Trek series. Right. Uh, definitely not a series for everybody, but a, a very enjoyable watch. Like, There's obviously going to be some hits and misses. I really enjoyed the fact that they try a bunch of different things throughout the series. Like, They're not afraid to do things that seem a little unconventional or 
broach certain ideas and they will admit that not every idea they tried landed but they tried it and just it was really enjoyable i watched it off blu-ray so i had the refinished special effects uh-huh. which i quite liked um i have nothing against original uh special effects but especially seeing to a newer, to newer viewers though they stand out like a sore thumb really and they, they, take they you hold up the when show. you when you consider it's late 60s i've seen a few episodes but where... younger viewers wouldn't even know what special effects from the 60s would be yeah, yeah. they'd be fair enough are you kidding me with this and it's when well, you can do better stuff on your phone these days yeah they'd be like what was what was going the on the occasional back? original special effect looked terrible there yeah. was some right. that were awful and they're Budgetary, obviously, yeah. television, nineteen sixties. But I love the new enhanced effects on these on these Me discs. Too. I think it's uh, I think it's great. I think it opens up the show to to newer viewers who well, might be uh, turned away from and it. And for the purists, I do like the fact that you can, with the set I have, you can watch the original effects if you want, or you can watch the the new ones. But you can also, and I found myself doing this quite a bit through the series. You can actually mid episode switch between the two. Mm-hmm. So I found myself quite often going back a couple minutes. And rewatching mm-hmm. it, I did that all the time with them. Yeah. yeah, and I found it really fascinating mm-hmm. to see. Okay, was this necessary? Did this actually add anything? And I thought, in a lot of cases, it really did. Like there was an episode. Oh, for, they would have done it if they could have. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. And and I think it definitely made certain worlds feel a lot more expansive like there's an episode where they are on Vulcan and just the establishing shot where they're showing Spock and Kirk walk to this meeting place and the original and again yeah they did what they they could with what they had but now revisiting it wow just it makes it feel like a more fleshed out world an actual place rather than just a painted backdrop which I mean obviously it's the 60s and whatever but yeah I thought most cases Going back and, and yet it never them. it never takes away from the no. episode when you're yeah, watching. Yeah, you both it. said that before, right? The special mm-hmm. effects yes. fit the flow and to the, the, the tone of the sometimes series. Sometimes right? you actually have to go back and say, "Am I watching enhanced effects yeah. or is yeah. this the original stuff?" And you're like, yeah. "Oh, because it's it's slight." Sometimes. Yeah, it's subtle, right? Like it's yeah. they don't beat you over the head with yeah. it. Like a look, look what we can do. Yeah. It's, a lot of it's. Just showing the Enterprise orbiting a planet or hitting warp or, you know, the odd sequence where it's ship-to-ship battle or Mm -hmm. just... If if anything takes you to that time period, it's the hairstyles. (laughs) Some of the uh, outfits. Some of the aliens and outfits and, yeah, for sure. And how the women are handled. Yeah. Yeah. In some ways. In in some ways. Uh, And I... That's one thing I was very aware of going through it is that they do they they do put women well not only women but minorities in positions where you can't think especially for the 60s that a lot of them were getting opportunities like a black man in charge of a in charge of a a Starfleet ship a lot right. of people would have been watching that at the time thinking that's preposterous or, or a lot worse than that well, yeah. yeah well yes that's the cleaned up version but <laughs> I thought it did a lot of things really well. For sure. It is, you know, it's way above other shows at the time. I'm just saying that they knew their audience, too, and they never shied away from having some eye candy on the show. Oh, for (laughs) sure. Yeah. Um, And to me, it started early on, but it very much became a spot the celebrity because there were so many that kind of guest starred before they really became anything through there. Like, even Clint Howard, when he was seven years old, (laughs) He he plays an alien and he probably I, looked exactly. <laughs> he really did. Like, it's down to the hair. There's yeah, no the mistaking hair. who that is. But you've got Julie Newmar that's in there, of course. Yeah. Terry Joan Gar's Collins. in a classic Terry episode. Gar. You've got uh, Joan Frank, Collins. Joan Collins. Mm. You got Frank Gorshin who's in there. Mm. Like a, a lot of people that at the time they might not have been anybody, but you yeah, definitely now you look and and they're thinking, okay. what the hell am I doing on this show? Yeah. Well, and even to the point where you can tell just the idea of television has kind of changed over the years. And you get an actor like Mark Leonard who plays Spock's father. Well, he's actually the first Romulan you ever see. And I remember, well, because Mm -hmm. I remember seeing that episode and thinking like, wait, because I'm not that well versed in Star Trek. I was thinking, wait, is is Spock's dad actually a Romulan? And then, no, they just reused him later. Just recast him. Yeah, Yeah, they just recast him. I find it very interesting, almost like you take it for granted, the structure of a show, because we're so used to cliffhanger endings or, you know, a season, the the finale will kind of wrap up an overarching story. But that's very only, that's only really recent. Like, you look back then, and it really is just 
a collection of episodes. There's no real overarching story. Mm -hmm. Everything's very self-contained. You look at, there's even shows in the 90s that are very much like that. And you kind of forget that that's only kind of a recent thing. Yeah, when you get a two-parter back then, it was a rarity and exciting. Like, wow, part two, what's going to happen next week? And yeah. that's a phenomenon that yeah. didn't happen a lot then. Yeah, and it is yeah, it is really relatively new. Yeah. Because I read uh, some of J.J. Abrams' first treatment notes for Lost when he was submitting it to the studio. And he goes forcefully to tell the studio, this is not an overarching story. This is a episode, <laughs> episodic television every week something on the island's gonna happen it'll be wrapped like lying through his teeth yeah it must have been but uh because the studios were not interested in any kind of storyline where people would watch they don't want people to or tune in one one time and not know what's going on mm -hmm. just, they're so scared of losing that absolutely audience. right and yet that's all television is now oh for sure Mm -hmm. All good television is now. All good nice television. Show. So yeah. um, after seeing the entire series, any episodes stand out in particular? There's a couple. Like I said, the first time you see the Romulans, I thought that was fantastic because it really deals with Captain Kirk communicating with the Romulan uh, captain. And you can see they're two sides of the same coin almost. Like the, there's that respect. And obviously this series really uses alien races as, a, as an allegory for racism and whatnot. And it was really interesting to see that, yeah, these, these two captains of their vessels from completely different races absolutely respected one another. And it was only that moment in time that pitted them against one another regardless of the respect that they had with one another. Um, City on the Edge of Forever... Yeah, it's a, it's great a one. classic one. It's great. Uh, I loved Mirror Mirror. That was that was great and fun. And I know they revisit that universe in uh, upcoming uh, series. So I'm I found really rewatching it. All the episodes I remember so fondly as a kid that yeah, I loved the ones that were that great. mostly the terrible ones. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And the newer ones that I loved were ones that I had dismissed as a kid because there was probably no action or they were about the ideas. ideas were over my head, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I would say definitely it's probably 70 to 80% good, 20% kind of uh, mm -hmm. not great, but you can kind of see the ideas that for a 50 year old show that's pretty good absolutely and so now that i've wrapped that up and i really enjoyed it and i could definitely see myself watching it again uh i'm watching the animated series and oh, yeah. which i loved wow. when i was a kid mm -hmm. so i'm committed i'm i'm just gonna start watching well obviously how many seasons did that last two okay there's only 22 episodes i believe and i'm about a third of the way through that had the any of the uh, original actors? Doing all, of all of them. They, all, right? they all, all did it. The only well. one that didn't was Walter Koenig because mm -hmm. they couldn't afford him. And actually, there was a really interesting... <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that too. Like, of all the actors they couldn't <laughs> afford, Walter Koenig? We couldn't Koenig? get Chekhov. Well, but the, there is a funny story behind it. And, and it's one of those things that makes me really respect Leonard Nimoy even more in that they... They had originally planned on just bringing the original Holy Trinity back. So mm -hmm. McCoy, Spock, and, and Kirk. And Leonard Nimoy stood his ground and said, I will absolutely not do this show unless you bring uh, Michelle Nichols and, uh, and Sulu back. Because these are groundbreaking roles for minorities and they absolutely should be included. And if they're not, you can recast Spock. And uh -huh. so they kind of, he backed him into a corner and they bent. And so therefore they couldn't, they couldn't include him, but he writes some episodes. So he is included. Okay. So he might not be the voice of Chekhov, but you know, out of that, it introduces some opportunities where they, uh, they actually have an alien on the bridge now because right. of course that's it's, right. It's animated, right? So mm -hmm. you, you're not restricted right. by certain budgetary. Was the alien pink? No, he's orange, and okay. he's got like a third I hand. Have vague memories of this show. Yeah. So yeah. and so far, it's good. Like they they even say like I mean it's seventies animation, so it's they're a lot of the same backgrounds. Yeah, and mm -hmm. you can tell they reuse some of the shots, but they even say that, that it's kind of written as the fourth season of Star Trek. So, uh, well, and really, you could look at it as the fourth and fifth uh, years of the original five year mission, right? right. And they were so, half an hour episodes yeah about 25 minutes right. each okay. so uh like i said i'm about hmm, probably about eight episodes through and i've enjoyed them they're they're good they're not dumbed down for kids 
Um, and I'm actually, I'm really glad they went this way because there was a, there was a time they were considering doing another Star Trek spinoff live action and it was going to be Star Trek cadets. So each cast member was going to have a kid following them around and man, that would have got monotonous and old quick. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's I'm interested really to hear when you're done, how you feel it adds to the original series. Yeah. As a viewing experience, yeah, I'd like to go back and revisit the original series too, and then yeah, and that was your recommendation. That was included on the set that you got. No, I you bought I bought separately? the animated set separately. Oh, okay. I think it was twenty bucks on Amazon or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's on Netflix right now too. Okay. So is it? I think, yeah, I think they pretty much oh. have everything Star Trek on Amazon or on Netflix right now. I'll have to check it out just for uh, uh, nostalgia. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's really interesting. So uh, yeah, that's. Star Trek talk, and then this, uh, my second thing will be rather quick, uh, just to wrap that up. Uh, my wife and I watched 10 Cloverfield Lane on Friday, and pleasantly surprised. I saw my kid. It's very good. Yeah. Have you I, seen it? Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed it, and not to give anything away, I mean, it's an older movie, but it's kind of one of those thrillers that relies on you going into it a little more blind, but I thought the performances were great. Oh, the performances are Is stellar. it um, yeah. like a found yeah. footage type? Oh, movie? I see. No, no, no. no, no like no, no. the original Cloverfield. Like Cloverfield. The original no, no. Right. Cloverfield was, but this is more structured as... It's a, a narrative, a, yeah. Yeah, a narrative in the wool thriller. Right. So it's, I think I would have enjoyed the original Cloverfield more if it wasn't that. Oh. That's good news, so... I, I really liked the original I also liked that actress who's in it is Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Yes, she's, she's a really of good. Mine, Scott Pilgrim. Yeah. yeah, it's it's really good. I it's it's the kind of movie where you don't really know where it's going and it has your second guessing and it's got you on the edge of your seat. And yeah, we really enjoyed it. You're kind of if you've seen Cloverfield, you're kind of wondering how it's gonna tie in and you have an idea of how it might work. And I'm not going to spoil anything and say how it does tie into it, but yeah, I really enjoyed, really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Definitely worth checking it out, and especially if I've only seen like Cloverfield once. Would you recommend me checking, seeing it one more time before I watch this? I quite like Cloverfield, actually. Yeah. It's I, you don't. It's not need, that I didn't like it; it's yeah. just I haven't felt the need to watch you, it. You since. don't need to watch it to enjoy Ten Cloverfield. I agree, Lane, but uh, it 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 helps if you have an understanding of what's going on. But if mm -hmm. if you've seen Cloverfield once. You get it. You understand what's going on. So then how this movie chooses to kind of align itself with that universe, you will, you'll get it anyway. Right. Yeah, that's the best way of putting it. It exists in the same universe as the original Cloverfield. Yeah, I look forward to seeing it. It's uh, directed by... Uh... Dan Trachenberg, who was yeah. the guy who did some of the episodes for Black Mirror. Oh, right. Yeah. Three. So, uh, yeah. And they're yeah, actually doing good. another movie in this universe next year. Yeah, I heard that, that they're going ahead with another one. I think it's called The God Particle, but again, it's right. it's very much its its own thing. It, it exists in the universe, but it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have anything to do directly with the two movies that came before it. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, it's relatively cheaply made, right? It's, uh, like they do a lot with the minimal budget. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it's only a couple sets, and yeah, there's not really a heavy reliance on special effects at all. Wow. So yeah, yeah, I look forward to seeing it. Really well done, and like I said, it, it just it it kept me guessing, anyways. Yeah, so. very strong sci-fi thriller. Yeah, very very highly recommended. That's for me. Ten Cloverfield Lane on Netflix. Mine is a uh, new release of an old movie. Uh, Criterion, the great Criterion, has released a Blu-ray copy of uh, Robert Altman's classic, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Oh, wow. This movie came out in 1973. Uh, this is, when people ask me what my favorite Western is, this is always in the top three or four for me. It's a movie, there's nothing else really like it, and I've, I just love it. I'm a huge Robert Altman fan, and this is, for me, his best film. It stars Warren Beatty and uh, Julie Christie. Basically, it's the story of kind of a two-bit gambler who moves into a town uh, just on its legs, right in the wilderness, and they're just scavenging day by day. And he kind of moves into this town and wants to set up a brothel and make himself the big man of town. And Julie Christie is the whore with the heart of gold who um, <laughs> wants to help him on his way. But it's such a dark, somber piece. And uh, you, did, you mentioned the town. It feels so authentic, yeah, so real. Hey? Yeah, one of the great things they did with this town was um, Altman uh, dressed up the set decorators in costume and had them working as they were shooting. So as film, as shots are being made with the actors in the background, you can see the town being built. By the actual... That makes so much sense, right. but I never knew right. that. Hold so on. every time that they step away from the town for a bit and they come back to it, uh, you see this town growing just in front of your eyes. It's just uh, oh. it's amazing. Uh, right in the heart of uh, 
British Columbia they shot it. Really? Yeah. The uh, costumes for the piece, uh, all the actors came up uh, when they got there uh, to the location. Robert Altman said, everybody pick your costumes, pick your uniforms, and pick it good because this is what you're wearing for the next three months. <laughs> if it rips, if it tears, you have to sew it back together. If your shoes break, you have to fix your shoes. So these actors were really put in this situation of, of authenticity that you can really, really come through the film. Like I said, it just feels like so different from any other movie. Besides that, it has uh, a score or songs from Leonard Cohen. Hmm. It's the first Sorry. time I ever heard Leonard Cohen's. I saw this movie when I was 17 years old and fell in love with it. And Leonard Cohen's music is a big part of it. Fits it like a T. The songs were written for it, but uh, you'd swear that they were. Uh, unfortunately, it was a big flop. Yeah, <laughs> Robert, <no> Robert <laughs> Altman's giant flops. So no one really saw it at the time. But over the years, it has definitely gained cult-like status. And I can't recommend it more highly. Uh, I agree. It's, it's one not of Altman's for, best. It's not for everybody, for sure. It does have a bit of a downer ending. And uh, it's a movie that you have to engage yourself with a bit because it's not going to jump off the screen and say, love me. But uh, every time you see it, it just gets richer for me. And uh, it's one of my favorite films of all time. Sounds like one. Can't I recommend see, it more. Because I, I, I do enjoy old westerns, but I like the different take on the western. Mm -hmm. So this sounds like it would be right up my alley. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's Altman, so it's pretty unconventional. And Right, he's a master of um, dealing with multiple actors and uh, having uh, several conversations going on at the same time. Yeah. He invented, I think it was like a 26 audio track. Oh, so geez. every actor could have their own mic. Before him, none of that stuff was ever done. You know, One of Robert Altman's first movies, uh, Jack Warner saw The Rushes and he said, what the hell is the matter with this guy? He's got all the actors talking at the same goddamn time. And Which, of course, is you know exactly what he was going for. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, as Robert Altman goes, it's... Uh, it's part of the authenticity it's of... It's just a great film book by one of the all-time great directors in movies, so... Hmm. Can't recommend it more. My other stuff is just uh, two recent films that both of you guys have seen. I've recently seen Kubo and Two Strings. I really liked it. I thought... I agree with you. It's a visual feast. Maybe not the greatest story, you know, going on. It's not a lot of plot, but, uh, man, some of those set sequences and some of the battle scenes and stuff, it's yeah. just, you've never seen anything like this with a uh, stop motion. No. Just, wow. I just, uh, you can't believe it really that, you know, some of it's not CG. I know that they did a blending process, yeah. but I watched the bonus features and a lot of the stuff that I thought was, must've been CG was all real. It's the kind of movie where the plot is almost, I, I hesitate to say inconsequential, but for me, there's not a lot of movies that I would say that I could watch beginning to end without any dialogue. But I would say that movie, you almost, you almost could just because I thought the music was very interesting. And I thought the animation was very interesting. And I think you could almost get all that you needed without any dialogue. In fact, if there's anything distracting in the film, it's some of the voice talents that they hired. Yeah. I, I don't I know agree. why film about Asian mythology has Matthew McConaughey in it. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. I didn't get that choice. And when you hear someone like George Takei, who's and in it briefly, like a minor role. you're like, yeah. oh my God, he, you know, this is what we want. Yeah. But um, besides that, you have to check it out. It's it's worth a look. Yeah. The other movie is the highly acclaimed Hell or High Water. I finally caught up with that. Mm -hmm. And yes, Dexter, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is, it's good. It's solid, but it is not, it's not going to make my top 10 of the year. No, it's, yeah, I, I would recommend it to fans of the genre, but it's, yeah, it's not well a stellar acted, well film. well performed, but I, I feel like I've seen this movie before, you know? Yeah. you Saving the farm, robbing I, the exactly. banks to save the farm and stuff. And, and there's some know, clever ideas in the um, way he does it with the banks. Yeah, but even, you know, you better have a spin on a bank robbery if you're planning on shooting one. Exactly. Right, so. And uh, you see what I was saying when I said, too, like just from the opening few minutes, you can see exactly where it's going. For sure. There's no surprises. In right. It. And I didn't dislike anything in the movie. I just didn't love anything in the movie. Yeah. And I can't I'd understand. Agree. Like you said, it had a 98% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. I mean, it's no. a solid film, but more... I would give it, I think you said a 7 out of 10? Probably a 7, 7.5 out of 10. Exactly. That's about what I would give it to. Be. Yeah, me too. I think you can trust Rotten Tomato scores as much as you can trust a rating on Netflix. Like, hmm. oh, I disagree just... with that. Oh, I disagree. <laughs> yeah, Darren, Darren really follows his Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. Well, well, okay, that might be a little extreme. I just, I mean, me it... coming from the 2% that didn't <laughs> like Roger Rabbit, but... Uh, <laughs> But I, it's more right than wrong, I suppose. It's just, yeah, I mean, I trust the average cinema goer almost zero, whereas mm -hmm. critics, sure, I don't always agree with them. 
but they're coming from a point of view of having seen a lot of movies and I can you know, understand when they're tired of something or have found something fresh. And so, yeah, when I see a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes, then wow, this is really got the critics set on fire. And then I see it and yeah, it's good. But is that just maybe a sign that it's been a slow year for them? And, you know, all of a sudden this movie, well, you know they what, found so a movie they like, so they all it could hop be. on it and it, could it be. jacks the rating up? Well, it's like Brian De Palma said about when he made um, Carlito's Way. And he said, okay, well, Sean Penn, we haven't seen you in a movie in a while. And this is really something different you brought here. The critics are going to love you. Al, sorry. I mean, you just had great acclaim on Scent of a Woman. The critics are going to say you're not doing anything worthwhile here. And they're going to look at the overall film and say, hey, you know, De Palma's done something fresh and, and new. And we generally like it. And, and he was spot on in every way. And this Kind of, you can read critics and how they're going to react to things in some way. Uh, so, yeah, at the same time, a movie that's kind of fresh like this, not groundbreaking, but kind of fresh, I think maybe it does get critics excited. I didn't see anything fresh in it, though. I felt like this kind of going to be a movie of fresh. 30 years ago. <laughs> no, exactly. You're, I mean, I agree with you. But also, I don't understand Rotten Tomatoes' system. And sometimes you look at it and it says the average rating is a 6.5 out of 10, and then it'll show 79%. I don't under, I honestly I don't know why I guess certain critics reviews carry more weight. I don't I just don't know how they work out their averages and come to those percentage points. In general, I find Rotten Tomatoes to as we've di diverged quite a bit from Hell or High Water. Mm -hmm. It's a good benchmark, but yeah, it's by no means the law when it comes to how I should feel about a movie. It's but a good a decent barometer for It's a good barometer. Yeah. It's a good way to, you know, judge whether or not you might want to check a movie out anyways. Right. And it's a thumbs up. Hell or High Water is a good movie. Yeah, a thumbs up for sure. Yeah. But I mean Don't yeah. sue us please, Siskel Niebert's estates for saying thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> only in reverent love. Yeah, so for both of those movies that were uh, that we were both going to do podcasts on, I'm you know I'm kind of glad that I watched both of them at home, frankly. But, I was uh, glad one was because I, I was glad because Kubo and the Two Strings is such a visual feast. I was happy to see that on the on the big screen, just because it was so beautiful and they did so much with mm -hmm. with animation. I was glad to see it on the big screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's oh, I gorgeous should, on the yeah, small. Yeah, I should correct too. myself. On the last podcast, I had mentioned that Kubo was. Uh, quite a success i know yeah, I, I didn't think I, it was. no i don't know where i'd read that because no it had actually lost money yeah it was had struggling. about a 70 million dollar budget yeah. i think it made about 40 yeah it was struggling to find it which is too bad sure. because you know it's not a great film but compared to a lot of the other kids stuff that's out like the piece of crap that finding dory turned out to be which um, i haven't seen which is yet. the biggest grossing movie of the year yeah kubo stands high above that yeah and definitely not i wouldn't say it's my favorite of the like a studios either like i i loved Coraline. i haven't seen all of them but definitely like Coraline was fantastic Coraline's outstanding yeah and this was maybe visually better but definitely as a whole not better i think this guy did paranorman yep that i like that too paranorman was pretty yeah. refreshing and i i haven't seen i haven't seen that either but i just i for me the things that stand out are are the ones that are maybe a little different, which this one was, but it didn't quite reach something like the movie Nine, where I thought that was it. It was a good mix of everything, and this just kind of missed the mark story wise, like you said. So not to right. beat it worse, but yeah. but you can't take away the visuals. So no, and like I said, and that that was why I was happy to have seen it mm -hmm. in the theater. So right. I do look forward to watching that, and uh, I'll let yeah. you know what I think. Excellent. You brought that far? I did. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's all I've got. So, Darren, you had one more thing? Yeah, sorry for being selfish and wanting to wrap up the show on my last thing. but it's No, that works out perfect. It's kind of a cool thing. I thought it would be a fun thing to go out on. I will pose a question to my co-hosts. Dun, dun, dun. dun. <laughs> Are you ticklish? Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where I'm going with this? Have you guys heard of this? The movie? The movie Tickled? Yeah. Oh, I have heard about this. I've wow. heard of it. Man, it's the best documentary I've seen in years. It is so good. If you haven't seen the trailer yet, watch the trailer oh. for Tickled now. Stop this podcast and watch the trailer for Tickled. It's yeah, the other guys on, uh, that I know that mentioned this, uh, I was quite dubious because what the hell are they talking about? Yeah, it's <laughs> and it's literally it's uh, that New Zealand journalist, 
And I can't remember what the deal was. I remember about five or six years ago, he interviewed Justin Bieber and there was, I don't know, I think the media was criticizing Bieber about his bland interview or something like that. Mm-hmm. Anyways, he's the director of the film and he's heard about this, uh, stumbled online across references to how uh, the term competitive endurance tickling. <laughs> and he said, what is this competitive endurance tickling? And sure enough, he catches a few videos on YouTube and okay there's got to be something here and he does some investigating and just the deep dark secrets he uncovers about the world of competitive endurance tickling will astonish you it is i can't say this more is, this is not a fake documentary it is not he's fake creating this no he's not no, catfishing anyone no there's nothing it totally has the setup of a mockument no it's mm-hmm. nothing i've never met any professional ticklers in my life really <laughs> no, no. that's not that you oh. know of in fact <laughs> i didn't even know that this existed me neither yeah if you do <laughs> <laughs> and there's big money to be really doled out. Uh, I'll say no more than that in professional endurance tickling. Uh, Do you pick where you tickle the person? Do you get to pick where you're tickled? Depend- tickle zone. <laughs> Depends on who's in charge of the filmmaking. I will. There must be some human way. beings on the planet that just are not ticklish. I don't know. You gotta get in there. There's some money to be made. Yeah, that's well, <laughs> so you've seen this for part two. Yeah, I did. Uh, Where, where'd you come across this documentary? Uh, we dug it up on a website online, Chris and I, and uh, I should say Chris did the legwork and found it. And well, we saw the trailer. So, man, we have to see this movie. And we watched it over a couple lunch hours. Uh, sorry to the filmmakers. I'll try and watch it legitimately and give you some money if I get the chance. But uh, it's yeah, I just couldn't wait to see it. And it's it's as riveting a documentary as I've ever seen on any subject. There's so much comes out in this. It's hard to say anything without spoiling it. Just watch the trailer. It'll give you an idea as to what direction it's going in. And uh, It sounds to me like the only way to take it is to where you're following a few different people who are entering into this. Very, Uh, very few people from the world of professional endurance tickling would would talk to them. Competitive. Sorry. Competitive endurance tickling. We call them PETs. Cats. Cats. Competitive endurance ticklers. Sorry. Competitive, right. They're competitive. Sorry. They're not Much better. Right. No, very, very few participants in, <laughs> in this world were even willing to speak to them. Yeah, that'll give you the idea of what you're getting into. It's mm-hmm. a very protective community. It's uh, kind of like eyes wide shut kind of thing. They dress in robes and stuff. Almost. And, you know. Almost. Oh I mean, it's it's like uh, secret handshakes. Yeah, it's, it's a dark world of <laughs> competitive gotta, endurance tickling. It, yeah, it, there's, be honest, there's no yeah. spinal tap or catfish about it. It's all real and it's... Is it, is it entertaining or is it car accident? Like you can't look away? Oh, it's very or? entertaining. Is it? Okay. No, nothing car nothing accident. Nothing cringeworthy. Or... It's frustrating. There's, okay. there's things in it where you think, man, what is... Hopefully now that this is uncovered, someone will get their comeuppance. And yet, it's, it'll frustrate you. Just right. very, it's a riveting, entertaining. I'm documentary. highly intrigued by this. Yeah, yeah you're not I'm the first person where. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've heard, I've heard this before, but I discounted it completely based on the subject. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think it I'll won the audience it. award at Sundance. Maybe that's it. Something right, like yeah. that. Like it's, it, I know it's got some press out there, and it's, it's got its fans. And I don't know. I've shown, I've asked a few friends. No, you got to watch this trailer, and. They've a few of them have leveled that same criticism. Fake, Darren? No, it's fake. No, it it is not fake. And honestly, I don't even see how you get that from watching the trailer. But some people thought that. They and just can't believe that it's real. I suppose. I suppose. And they've said, "Wow, you know, you're right. I have to watch this movie." And In a world where you can make a very comfortable living playing video games professionally, I have no problem believing that there's competitive tickling league. And that's probably completely bastardizing <laughs> any name, but I have no doubt that this exists. The CTL. I don't even know how to dodge <laughs> saying anything about if, that. But if you can dodge a wrench. <laughs> Yeah, uh, everyone, check out Tickled if you have the opportunity. Okay. Curiosity yeah, peak. I'll see if I can find it somewhere. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right, let's wrap things up, and uh, we'll see you guys again for, oh, my God, Rogue One. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. Pew, pew. All right. Those uh, are lasers. Yeah. For those <laughs> of you who don't know. <laughs> Ow. Ow. Check you guys later. Pew, pew. Bye. Bye.